Hello everyone and welcome back to Earthquake Engineering with Swapnil and today we are going to look at the effective stiffness. This was a topic that many of us were unaware or ignored in our practice until the 2016 version of the IS-1893 Indian standard for earthquake resistant design of structures brought into our attention. Similarly, the updated version of NBC 105 2020 is no exception to this. Instead, it goes ahead by introducing the effective stiffness to the other components such as walls in addition to the beams and columns introduced by the IS-1893. So without further delay, let's start. So what is the effective stiffness in building codes and what provisions do different building codes have? Now before talking about that, we have to understand that seismic analysis and design of reinforced concrete structures are performed based on linear response. However, it is universally accepted that under severe earthquakes, inelastic response and cracking are accepted in structures. Moreover, cracking of RC sections can occur in seismic events of intensity lower than the design level earthquake. Therefore, element properties should reflect this condition and inertias of beams and columns should be reduced accordingly. In an attempt to reflect this condition, building codes prescribe the cracked stiffness in the form of effective stiffness which is a certain percentage of gross stiffness. It is a function of applied loading and the detailing of the component which we will see later and it can be an iterative process since the assumed effective stiffness of RC elements in structural analysis model influences the dynamic characteristics of the structure which in turn changes the results of the analysis and effective stiffness. So how practical is this? Structural engineers are always in pressure to meet the deadline. So if you ask this question with regards to its practicality, then it is obviously going to be very difficult. And instead, to simplify the design process, we assign only one stiffness modifier per element. So what could be the implications of this? First of all, the analysis models can be sensitive to the stiffness of a single element because it can vary due to loading and location. For example, stiffness modifier of RC walls in ACI 318 have different provisions for cracked and uncracked walls. The ACI 31819 clause 6.6.3.1.1 states that if the factored moments and shears from an analysis based on the moment of inertia of a wall taken equal to 0.7 of IG indicate that the wall would crack in flexure based on the modulus of rupture, the analysis should be repeated with i equals 0.35 of ig in those stories where cracking is predicted using factored loads. Likewise, for different sets of ground motion written periods, say service level earthquake or the design basis earthquake or the maximum considered earthquake, the effective stiffness could be unique for each of these because as discussed earlier, it is a function of loading and detailing of the component. So the question is, could we be overestimating the service level earthquakes loading and does this have the potential to produce large displacements? So before trying to answer that question, let's see how the effective stiffness is calculated. Now let us go back to the basics, basics of section analysis in particular moment curvature analysis. It is a method to determine the load deformation behavior of a concrete section using nonlinear material stress strain relationships. The premise of this is that for a given axial load, there exists an extreme compression uh, fiber strain and a section curvature at which nonlinear stress distribution is in equilibrium with the applied axial load. A unique bending moment can be calculated at this section curvature from the stress distribution. Also, the stress strain relationships used to perform section analysis should take into account the reinforcement detailing that is provided to enhance the strength and ductility. A section can be separated into two distinct regions. The first one is the unconfined and another one is the confined. The, uh, the enhancement of compression stress strain relationship of the cold concrete is a consequence of a well-detailed transverse and longitudinal reinforcements. The closely spaced longitudinal reinforcements with appropriate amount of stirrups spaced closely acts to restrain the lateral expansion of concrete. This helps to maintain the integrity of the core concrete. 
the theoretical stress strain relationship proposed by J.B. Mander accounts for all of this. I will not go much into detail but provide you key information. Uh, I have included the reference at the description box down below so that you can plot the stress strain relationship on your own. As shown, it has two distinct relationships for the confined and the unconfined concrete. The F prime CO is the unconfined compressive stress at the strain corresponding to epsilon CO, which is taken equal to 0.002. The ultimate strain, epsilon SP, taken as the spalling strain for the unconfined concrete can be assumed to be 0.004. Likewise, F prime CC corresponds to the confined compressive stress at the strain corresponding to epsilon cc which can be calculated using these equations. F1 is the maximum lateral confining pressure exerted on the core concrete when the transverse reinforcements are stressed to their yield stress Fyh. In this equation and rho v is the volumetric confinement ratio. For a circular section, this is equal to 4 times the area of transverse reinforcement divided by the diameter of the confined core and this is measured to the central line of the hoop or spiral and S which is the spacing of the hoop or spiral along the section's longitudinal axis. For a, uh, for a rectangular section, this is multiplied by a new term CE which varies from 0.75 to 0.85 depending on the width of the section and spacing of the transverse reinforcements. Now for the ultimate strain epsilon CU, it is defined as the strain at which the first hoop fracture occurs and this is determined by tracing the work done on the confined concrete and longitudinal steel when deformed in compression. When the work done exceeds the available strain energy of the transverse reinforcement, then the hoop fracture occurs and the section can be considered to have reached its ultimate deformation. This requires the knowledge of stress-strain relationship of the reinforcing steel as well. In the design of RC elements, strain hardening property is generally ignored. However, for the evaluation of moment curvature relationship, the stress-strain relationship for the reinforcing steel should reflect this property. So any material model for reinforcing steel that accounts this can be used. In this particular model, the stress corresponding to the yield strain epsilon y is denoted by Fy, which plate use between the yield strain and the onset of strain hardening denoted by epsilon sh. Finally, the strain epsilon su is reached and this is characterized by local naking in the reinforcement and stress corresponding to this is the ultimate stress fu. For a reinforcing steel of yield stress 415 MPa, epsilon sh can be taken equal to 0 0.008 whereas the ultimate strain can be taken equal to 0.1 to 0.12 and the ratio between the ultimate stress to yield stress varies between 1.35 to 1.5. The ultimate strain in the confined concrete can be calculated using this equation. For example, for a rectangular section 20 MPa on confined stress with length of the confined core equal to 400 mm with transverse reinforcements of diameter 10 mm at a spacing of 150 mm would result the ultimate strain of confined concrete to 0.016 with confined stress of about 25 MPa at a strain of 0.005. So once the stress strain relationship for concrete and reinforcing steel is selected, we can perform this analysis applying the equilibrium and compatibility condition. So before we go straight into the equation, let's see what are its assumptions. The first one, strain profile is linear at all stage up to the ultimate stage. At any stage, the nonlinear stress strain relationship of concrete and steel is known. Tension in concrete is ignored. And finally, axial force is applied at the centroid of the section. The moment curvature analysis can be performed by using the conventional approach of dividing the section into number of slices perpendicular to the loading axis and applying the equilibrium and compatibility conditions. 
this was discussed earlier however let's look at the fiber section approach in this approach the section is divided into number of layers of fibers along the local axis and each of the fiber area is mapped with the corresponding material model these include unconfined concrete confined concrete and the reinforcing steel so first select the strain in the extreme compression fiber starting from the lowest value say epsilon naught from the concrete material model and assume the depth of neutral axis c and then calculate the curvature based on this since we are performing the analysis using fiber section approach it is essential to compute the curvature for both axes the concept remains same now locate the centroid of the section and calculate the strain at the centroid using similar triangles from the assumption that plane section remain plane let's call this strain epsilon a similarly calculate the strain at the other individual fibers as well then find out the value of stress corresponding to these individual fibers from the material model multiplying these stresses of these individual fibers with the corresponding area gives the force the force is summed to check whether the equilibrium condition is satisfied or not if not then revise the value of neutral axis depth and calculate curvature until the equilibrium is satisfied within the accepted limit then compute the moment about individual local axis by using these equations which is simply the sum of the product of the forces in the individual layers times the distance from the centroid and finally the process is repeated for other values of extreme compression fiber up to the ultimate compression in confined concrete as discussed earlier since this process involves iteration it is done best by writing your own routine in a programming language after performing the section analysis for the various values of extreme compression fiber strain we get its associated curvature and the moment for a given axial load now for our interest we want to find out distinct points in this plot such as the yield curvature the ultimate curvature and calculate the stiffness based on it so the question is can we do it visually well it turns out that this is not possible so for our use we want to find out the stiffness and it must be realized that for concrete sections the elastic stiffness should not be based on the initial uncracked stiffness as this occurs only in very low level of seismic response so the procedure is to use an elastic second stiffness based on joining the origin through the elastic first yield to the nominal yield the first yield curvature denoted by phi prime y and the corresponding moment or my is defined as the stage when the extreme tension reinforcement yields first or the extreme compression fiber attains a strain 0.002 whichever occurs first likewise the nominal moment capacity denoted by mn is defined as the stage when the extreme tension reinforcement attains a strain 0.015 or the extreme compression fiber attains a strain 0.004 whichever occurs first now the calculation of stiffness becomes possible through moment curvature analysis of this section the stiffness of elastic branch and the plastic branch is defined by these equations now let's dig into the moment curvature analysis and find out hidden treasures from it i have included the reference here it is mentioned that number of analysis were performed for various sections and numerical results were verified experimentally for illustration purpose i'm going to talk about the circular section and this is applicable to rectangular section as well so the properties is as follows you can have a look at it terminology alert the results are expressed in terms of dimensionless quantities so before looking at the moment curvature plots let's have a look at the terminologies so the dimensionless nominal moment capacity is defined as the ratio of nominal moment capacity to the concrete compressive strength times the cube of its sectional diameter similarly the dimensionless yield curvature is defined as the ratio of yield curvature times the sectional diameter to the yield strain of the reinforcing steel 
Now this is a moment curvature plot with bilinear idealization as discussed earlier. It can be seen that the moment capacity is the function of axial load ratio and the amount of reinforcing steel. As the axial load ratio increases, the moment capacity also increases. Same goes with the amount of reinforcing steel. But notice the yield curvature, there is not much variation. The same thing is shown in this plot as well. Uh, this is between the axial load ratio and the dimensionless nominal moment capacity which increases as the axial load ratio and the amount of reinforcing steel increases. However, if you look at the plot between the axial load ratio and the dimensionless yield curvature, then even for high amount of reinforcing steel in the range 4 to 5 percent, it does not vary much and the average value of this quantity is 2.25. Based on this, it can be concluded that the yield curvature is independent to moment capacity. So based on this, for various sections, the yield curvatures are as follows. You can have a look. The effective stiffness defined earlier depends on the nominal moment capacity, which depends on the axial load ratio and the amount of reinforcement. It is evident from this figure that the value of effective stiffness also increases as the axial load ratio increases and the amount of reinforcement increases. Based on this, some codes such as the ACI 318, which is the building code requirements for structural concrete practiced in the USA, define the effective stiffness as the function of section parameters and factored internal forces. The same goes with the ASC 4113, seismic evaluation and retrofit of existing buildings, which provide uh, effective stiffness values to be used with linear procedures. So to summarize, the analysis of RC structures based on linear response should account the cracking that structures experience and this is done by assigning modifiers to the gross stiffness. The cracked stiffness or the effective stiffness which is a fraction of gross stiffness is related to its strength while the yield curvature is independent. Thank you everyone for watching till the end. I hope this explains the provisions related to the effective stiffness in building codes. Please feel free to comment in the section down below if you have any queries related to this or anything else. And if you like this, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Thank you everyone.